are. So we're going to go ahead and begin so that we can be respectful of everybody's time. And we want to thank you for joining us for this Zometica PulseVet sponsored webinar. Our topic today is going to be shockwave therapy in canine and feline patients. It's presented by Dr. Jennifer Viducci. After graduating with her veterinary degree from the Ohio State University in 2007, Dr. Vitucci moved to St. Louis with her husband, Mike. They owned a small animal general practice for 12 years before recently moving to the Florida Panhandle. Dr. Vitucci's love of geriatric patients and improving their quality of life by treating mobility and arthritis issues led her to become a certified canine rehabilitation therapist through the Canine Rehab Institute in 2019. Since selling their practice in early 2021, she has been with PulseVet, now a Zometica company, as the professional services veterinarian for the shockwave therapy line. So without further ado, please join me as we welcome Dr. Jen Vitucci. Thank you so much, Susan, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here again during your lunch hour. If it's your day off, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. So hopefully you'll learn something or I'll entertain you at least for the next 45 minutes or so. I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, Susan is gonna route those to me. So if you have them, feel free to type them in. So we are gonna talk about shockwave therapy in our small animal patients. And as Susan introduced me, um, I have been in general practice for 15 years and I've been with PulseVet for the last year and a half. And then recently moved to the Florida Panhandle. So I live kind of near Destin, Fort Walton Beach, if you're familiar with that. And we'll hear a little bit, I have a little bit of a hobby farm. Um, so occasionally on our next slide, we'll see a couple of images of my pets. I have a sulfur crested cockatoo, a dog. This is my Bernie's Mountain Dog vocal, two cats, a bearded dragon, a rabbit, six chickens, three goats. I think that's it. Oh no, and a pig. Okay. I forgot one. Um, so any, I, mean, I don't know what's next, but we're ready for the next pet. So let's dive right in with what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about what is shockwave therapy. How does it work in my patients? What is it actually doing inside the body? What are we thinking about using it for? What are the indications in small animals? What is some of the scientific evidence that we have that shockwave works? I'm gonna throw in some case examples to hopefully entertain you. We're gonna talk about how we use it in small animals. So what's the treatment protocol for our dogs and cats? How do we use it in the clinic? And just a little bit about how it's gonna benefit my practice. So as I said, this is Pickles, my sulfur crested cockatoo. That is Vicky Bean, the pig. And then that is one of my three goats. That's Axwell. Um, I have a Swedish goat, Mafia. So that's my pygmy cross. Okay, diving right in. So what is a shockwave, right? It's nothing to do with electric shock. It's kind of a big, scary term. That's always what it's been called. But it is actually a high energy sound wave. So it can be produced by all sorts of different things naturally. So supersonic aircrafts, explosions that come out of a gun. But the example I use most frequently is lightning and thunder. So lightning is an electrical impulse that actually changes the pressure of the air around it. And that sudden pressure change causes the sound of thunder. And so that's why we count right after the lightning, how long till we hear the thunder so we can see how far away it is. That's how far the sound travels towards us. And when you wake up in the middle of the night to that big boom of thunder, you will often feel your walls shake or your windows shake. And that is literally sound energy being deposited into the walls of your house. So that's what I think of when I think of sound energy. I think of that lightning and thunder example. You can also, this is a very dramatic visual, but I think it helps us understand what that sudden pressure change looks like. So this is underwater. On the right, we have an electrical impulse. So it's in the pool and we have these balloons filled with water. And so if you have like a depth charge in a submarine or if lightning strikes the water when you're swimming, it actually causes a shockwave. And so when that electrical impulse goes off, Hold on, there we go. 
Um, it causes a sudden pressure change in the water. And so you'll see the balloons are sort of deforming and deflating and all of these things. And that they're absorbing the sound energy. And so that's a really just dramatic visual, like I said, of what sound energy is inside the body. What isn't shock wave, right? So we know it's sound energy. It's not a radial pressure wave and it's not laser therapy. So a radial pressure wave is often marketed as a shock wave in both veterinary medicine and on the human market, but it is actually a mechanical energy. It's a very superficial energy that's stimulating from, it's like a theragun, right? But a little more dramatic. And what happens is that energy radiates and dissipates. It's very unfocused and it doesn't go very deep. It stays very superficial. And so it's often called a shockwave, but it's literally not the sound energy that's affecting the body. It's the mechanical energy. And shockwave compared to laser therapy, laser is light energy. And light is going to have a lower penetration depth. We're going to get less energy to the treatment area. Energy is going to be lost as heat when it hits the tissue, depending on the type of laser. And so usually more treatments are going to be required to treat musculoskeletal indications. And both of these, it makes sense when we think about our bodies and our patients' bodies as mostly water. So our body's made up of about 80% water, same with our dogs and cats. And sound energy travels really well in water. If you are a submarine, you're using sonar. If you're a whale or a dolphin, you're communicating with noise. You are not gonna shine a flashlight because that's not gonna go very far. Light does all sorts of things when it hits water. It refracts, it reflects, it attenuates, whereas sound stays very intact as it moves through water. And so that's why we're able to achieve greater penetration depths with greater energy in shockwave therapy. We're not going to go too much into the physics of shockwave, but just so that we know that there is some clear things that make it a shockwave. And I also really like this image about the focal area. So shockwave has to have this extremely rapid rise time. So it has this really quick pressure change. It causes a slight cavitation at the end. So it has a slight negative pressure. But the most important part is this clearly defined focal area. And we're gonna spend quite a few slides talking about focal area. And regardless of how we make our shockwaves, we need to know where we're measuring that energy. And so this dark blue oval in that bottom graph is going to be our focal area. So when I start talking about that, that's what we're going to picture, right? If, if we, that is the, if the bottom's the tissue and we're putting sound energy in, that's where we're measuring the focal area. So an example of this is an electrohydraulic shockwave, but all of the shockwave devices are going to have fluid, we're going to create the pressure change, and then we're going to capture all of the sound that goes backwards with the reflector. So when we talk about focal areas and depth of penetration, a lot of it is going to be dependent on this reflector shape in the back of the trope. So electrohydraulic specifically, there's a spark gap in there or a spark plug, and there's an electrical impulse that goes between the two of them. It's inside the fluid, and just like lightning, lightning bursts goes off, changes the pressure of the fluid, and creates the sound. So a lot of it's going to go forward on its own. Um, you know, it's going to go out 360, so some of it's going to go out the end of the trode regardless, and then the reflector is going to catch the rest of it and move it out forward as well. And so that's what we're talking about. Again, how we're generating and measuring that focal area is dependent on the shape of the trode and the shape of the reflector that's going to push the energy forward into the tissue. And there's different ways to make shockwave. So that example that I just showed was electrohydraulic, that lightning and focused thunder. And so it's going to have the largest focal area the ability to create the highest peak pressure and the fastest rise time. So it is a true shockwave at all of the settings. Electromagnetic is like a loudspeaker. And so if you're at a concert or a show or something and you see the black part of that speaker booming, that is a shockwave, right? So there's going to be coils inside 
fluid inside that handpiece. We're going to put electricity across the coils. They're going to vibrate, which is going to create the pressure change and going to create the sound. It has a little lower peak pressure, a little smaller focal area, and a little slower rise time. So it's going to be a true shock wave only at those highest energy settings. Piezoelectric is focused vibrating crystals. So again, we're going to have a reflector. We have crystals inside, inside the fluid. We're going to put an electrical current across those crystals and they're going to vibrate. And that is what's going to create the pressure change inside there. That's what's going to create the sound. And then the reflector shape is what's going to push it out into the tissue. It's going to have, again, a little smaller focal area, a little lower peak pressure, and a little slower rise time. And piezoelectric and electromagnetic were both originally designed to break up kidney stones in people. And so kidney stones in people are very small, right? They're only five or six millimeters. They're less than a centimeter. And so they wanted to be able to have this focal area that could hit that kidney stone, but not damage the surrounding tissue. And so that's where those came from. They wanted that really small, intense focal area. And then as we talked about earlier, the radial pressure wave. So it's actually a um, firing pin inside that mechanical gun and basically applies pressure as it fires to the end. And again, mechanical pressure, but it is not a focused shock wave. So it's not gonna look like that graph where we're gonna have that clear focal area. It's just gonna dissipate very quickly at the surface and mostly stimulate the tissue with mechanical energy. So those are different ways to make shock waves, right? So we know a shock wave is this high energy sound wave. Here's different ways that we can make them. And they're all gonna have different focal volumes. And so it's technically less than six decibels at the max energy. That's where that blue oval is. And this is not to scale, so don't judge me, but you can see electrohydraulic versus electromagnetic versus piezoelectric, right? They're all gonna have kind of different focal sizes and the volume of tissue affected by the sound energy is going to be different. And so I sort of liken the electrohydraulic to more of a flashlight beam size and the piezoelectric to more of a laser pointer, just in my own mind so I can understand the differences. So why are we sort of beating this focal zone and energy dead horse, right? Why have we spent so many slides on it? And because it determines our treatment protocols. So depending on what type of device is generating your shockwave, we're going to have to use it differently, which makes sense, right? If we are trying to treat an indication in my Burning's Mountain Dog, and we have a flashlight beam compared to a laser pointer, we're going to need different amounts of pulses and energy to deliver the same amount of healing power, right? So a piezoelectric, anywhere between 750 to 3,000 pulses per treatment, a minimum of six to eight treatments total, and the frequency of treatments is about once a week, sometimes twice a week. Electrohydraulic devices are 500 to 1,000 pulses per treatment, one to three treatments total, and the frequency is about every two weeks. So just more energy getting delivered at one time in fewer pulses when compared to a piezoelectric device. So it's important to know how your shock waves are being made so that it makes sense to you why your treatment protocols are gonna be different. So what happens now that we've created this high energy sound wave, right? So that energy is transmitted into the tissue. So it's applied superficially. We use ultrasound gel to transmit the sound. And there's gonna be all sorts of factors, right? When we talk about reflector shape and how the trode head is, and that determines that focal energy and that focal volume. And when it hits areas of acoustic impedance or density change, it's gonna have energy deposited. So, you know, fascial planes, tendon ligaments, bone surfaces, sort of anywhere along there, it's gonna get some energy deposited. And what happens on a cellular level is compression and tensile forces actually are applied to the cell. So the big fancy term I use is the cell squishes a little bit. And in response to that squish, the cells release cytokines and growth factors for healing. 
So that sound energy, just like when it comes through your house and the air and hits the walls, right? It's gonna go through your body and hit the cell surface. And that's how we're gonna stimulate healing. So we're gonna go back, very dramatic example of the depth charge in the water. But you can see that when that sound energy goes through the tissue, it's gonna hit those balloons and cause those compressive and tensile forces. I repeat, this is much more dramatic than would ever be inside the body, but I just think it's a really good visual. So we understand that it's causing a physical force inside the body when that sound energy gets deposited. The sound energy absorption is actually a healing stimulus. So that physical shockwave causes a biological response inside the body. So it releases all sorts of cytokines and growth factors that are important in healing. So there's only three things on here, but I like to think of it as four separate things. So it's going to increase blood flow. So it's going to create new blood vessels through neovascularization. There's going to be endothelial cell proliferation. Vasodilation is going to occur. So it's going to bring in lots of blood flow to an area. It's going to control pain and inflammation. So through those cytokines, nitric oxide release, things like that, we're going to control pain and inflammation in the area. It's going to stimulate the release of BMP, so bone morphogenetic protein. So we're going to cause cellular bone production, bone regeneration and healing. And then it's also going to improve the quality of healing in a tendon and ligament. So if you don't like words, but you like pictures, uh, that is just another way of saying everything that I've said, right? We're gonna be really good at increasing blood flow, controlling pain and inflammation, and also improving the quality of that tendon and ligament healing. So what really put Shockwave on the map on the veterinary medicine side was in the equine. So they were tearing those big suspensory ligaments in their lower limb. And when a tendon or ligament tears or injures, it will heal, but it heals with fibrin and scar tissue. And so it's much weaker and prone to re-injury. And so what they found is when they were shock waving these horses, they were returning to this more linear, normal fiber pattern, which was much stronger and not prone to re-injury. And so that's kind of where it all started. Obviously, we've learned a lot more about what shock wave does in the body but it was really that fiber alignment and the strengthening that occurred in those tendons and ligaments that got shockwave going originally. So a couple other things that it's been shown to do besides those four things is disrupt biofilm. So biofilm is kind of that invisible force shield that bacteria produce that prevents antibiotics from getting to them. And so you can see this is what it looks like microscopically. And then you can see that sort of shiny, gross wound right there. And it creates a lot of resistance because the bacteria antibiotics can't get to the bacteria. And so shockwave has been shown to break up that biofilm, which allows our antibiotics to work better. We're going to talk a little bit more about this one in detail, but it's been shown to decrease cartilage degradation, inhibit the increase of those inflammatory enzymes inside the joint in arthritis, and remodel subchondral bone and make it stronger. And the last thing is it induces a temporary analgesic effect. So important in small animals for post-op recovery, for restrictions, things like that. And then on the equine side, for performance horses, there's actually rules about withdrawal for shockwave treatment in horses. It's a, depending on the sport, it can be anywhere from four to 10 days where they're not supposed to shockwave before they compete because the analgesic is strong enough that it can actually mask some things and we don't want the horses to get injured. So those are a couple other things that it does besides pain and inflammation and blood flow and all those things we just talked about. Okay. We talked about what a shockwave is, how we make one, how it works inside the body. And so now what are we going to use it on in our dogs and cats? And so tendon ligaments and muscle healing. So it can be an alternative to surgery. If conservative treatment's failing, we can use it with rehab programs. So this is going to be your biceps and supraspinatus tendinopathies, Achilles tendon injuries, partial cruciate ligament tears, 
We've had some success with fibrotic myopathy and other contracture, iliopsoas injuries. So basically any of those type of things, right, we're going to get that improved tendon ligament fiber alignment when we use shockwave. A couple studies to go over. So this one was done, it says Dr. Gallagher, that was the resident, but it's actually Dr. Alan Cross at Georgia Vet Specialist, which is now Blue Pearl. And so this was one of the first small animal studies and they did it on post-op TPLO patellar ligament desmitis. So they knew that was kind of a common sequela that the patellar ligament got thick after TPLOs. So they did a prospective blinded study where they, did one group with nothing and one group they shockwaved at four and six weeks after surgery. And then they measured the patellar ligament thickness with x-rays and ultrasound. And they found that it was statistically significantly decreased at six and eight weeks. So after one treatment and after the second treatment. So it was really helpful shockwave at, you know, decreasing that swelling and helping with the patellar ligament thickness. This is just an example down here, this sort of terrible image um, of ultrasounding the patellar ligament and just showing different levels of disruption. I had a hard time finding a good picture that would show up for you guys. Shoulder lameness. So this was a retrospective study done at Tufts and um, Dr. Becker was the resident and Dr. Mike Kowaleski, who taught me when I was at Ohio State, did this. And it was for dogs that had shoulder lamenesses that were not responding to conservative management. So the median duration of lameness was nine months or more. And this was, again, biceps, supraspinatus, tendinopathies, medial shoulder instabilities, calcifications were on there. And the patients received three treatments, three weeks apart. Um, important note, no complications were noted following treatment. So nothing bad happened to any of the dogs. In the short term, nine out of nine had improved or resolved lameness. And in the long term, seven of the 11 dogs were still considered to be better or completely normal after that treatment. And I always mention these two because shockwave at this point was like the last effort, right? We've done everything else we can possibly do, or let's try the shockwave. So these dogs didn't have any additional treatment in this time. And to have that level of improvement with the shockwave was impressive. This case is JJ, the 15-year-old female spade Australian Shepherd, which you'll see a video of her in a minute. I'm not sure where Australian Shepherd came from, but these are from the records. And she came in with a cruciate tear to the left rear leg in October. And she'd already had a TPLO on the right leg. Mom didn't want to do anything else. She's 15. So she came in grade three out of five lame. And so Dr. Rice at Coastal Holistic said, well, let's do shockwave on her. So she did three treatments, two weeks apart. So after the first treatment, she was two out of five lame. After the second treatment, she was barely limping anymore. And then after the third treatment, she no longer had any lameness. So this treatment ended in February. And then this video was from about eight weeks ago. And so this is JJ walking around in the hospital had a recheck about when when is it September in July. So doing pretty well. Okay. So tendons, ligaments, muscles. So next is going to be bone healing. So fractures and osteotomies. So it can be something, a delayed union, a non-union, a fracture or a TPLO that maybe has comorbidities like Cushing's or diabetes and we're concerned about healing or something that we're not gonna surgically repair like a digit metacarpal metatarsal, something we're managing in a bandage, which is awful. We can speed up that bony healing and get them back on their feet and out of that bandage sooner. So this study was done at Colorado State. So it's a two-part study. First phase, they took all these x-rays, so four, six, eight, and 10 weeks after post-TPLO. And so they were divided into two groups. One group got two treatments of shockwave, one group got nothing. And then they did radiographic bone healing scores to blinded radiologists to see how the dogs responded after TPLO shockwave versus not. And so they found at four weeks, it was significantly improved, better at six and eight weeks. And then at eight weeks, all of the shockwave treated dogs had healed osteotomies, but less than half of the sham group did. So that was really interesting. 
So a couple weeks quicker till the sham group week 10 started healing. This is an x-ray from that initial phase one study. So on the left is the sham group, six week post-op radiograph. And on the right is the shockwave treated group, six weeks post-op. And you can see that it's pretty significantly farther along in the healing process on that osteotomy compared to the rest. They went on to enroll a bunch more dogs in phase two, did a little bigger study. So they ended up with 54 stifles total. And they only did rads at eight weeks because that was just easier with that many dogs. And there were no major complications in either group and all the osteotomy healed. But they found that the median healing scores were significantly higher for the shockwave group compared to the sham group. And this was Dr. Kivas and Dr. Felix Dorr out at Colorado State. And there he is. This is not a patient from that study. This is actually uh, Marley the bear from the Colorado Zoo had some stifle arthritis um, that they got to treat. So just a fun photo. Couple case studies from University of Tennessee, Dr. Marty Drum. He had three dogs that did not have healing TPLOs. We were greater than 15 weeks out delayed healing. And so each got one shockwave treatment um, at energy level three. A month later, came back, they were healing, pain and lameness were much improved and kind of restarted that healing process. This is a case, Butters, the 15-year-old male near Chihuahua. So this was sent to me. My husband is actually a veterinarian um, at a surgery center here in Florida. And so had some left metatarsal fractures. These were a couple months old already. He works at our referral center. And so the treatment plan was we're going to do a splint for four weeks and we're going to start shockwave. So this was that presentation before the first shockwave. This is Butters, who looks exactly like a 15-year-old male leader chihuahua should look. Um, getting his shockwave wide awake. He's not sedated. He just, he just looks like that. <laughs> So oh, these are the recheck rads at one month. So repeated the shockwave treatment, took the splint off and did a soft bandage. And then these, this is the x-ray at two months. So two shockwave treatments, eight weeks later, this is how much healing butters. Had. It was a very cute, adorable patient. Okay. Tendons, ligaments, muscles, bone healing. Now let's talk about osteoarthritis and chronic pain. So osteoarthritis, anywhere that you can get irritation, right? So stifles, hips, shoulders, elbows, wrists, hocks, anywhere you get arthritis, you can shockwave. And it's helpful for symptom management. So it's going to help control the pain and inflammation, but also disease management. So we're going to talk about that in a minute, how it actually helps to slow the progression of osteoarthritis. We all know that arthritis is a lifelong problem. Once we have it, it's going to continue to get worse at some progressive rate. When we take x-rays today and we take x-rays in a year, it's going to be a little bit worse. And so just to review the osteoarthritis cycle quickly, so it starts with instability, right? So we're, we have muscle weakness, injury, something like that, and we get a synovitis. And then we get the overproduction of macrophages and synoviocytes. The synovium gets hyperplasia. Those macrophages overproduce those pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then there's inflammatory mediators in and out of the cartilage and lining. It initiates cartilage destruction. And then we get chronic pain and inflammation and disability. But we're still unstable, right? We're hoping to help with that. But once we're on the train, on the cycle, we tend to continue moving forward. And so what Shockwave has been shown to do is interrupt right here where the macrophages overproduce those pro-inflammatory cytokines. So shockwave is going to increase the good things like VEGF, BMP2, and decrease the bad things. So osteocalcin, COMP, MMPs, TNF, that tissue necrosis factor, it's going to downregulate all of those. And so it's going to help to slow that cartilage destruction and help remodel the bone and slow the progression of disease. 
And it's been shown in humans and rats and horses. And we're actually getting ready to do a big study in the dog at Colorado State showing that it's going to help to slow the progression of disease. But this was a rat study, which is really interesting. Don't fall asleep. I know it's rats where they took and divided them into three groups. So one group had nothing. One group had their ACL surgically transected. And the third group had a surgically transected ACL and one shockwave treatment. And then they followed the rats out with blood and urine biomarkers, and they did x-rays, and then, of course, harvested the rats, unfortunately, and did histopath. But they found that the single treatment of shockwave after that surgically induced transected ACL, that it had significantly less osteoarthritis and significantly decreased cartilage degradation than in the rats that had nothing. So just the one treatment helped slow that progression of osteoarthritis. On the human side, a study came out earlier this year in January, and they did three groups of naturally occurring stifle arthritis in humans. And so they had one group that had injections of HA in the joint, they had a short-term NSAID use group, and then they had a shockwave group. And they followed them out for a year, and they found that the shockwave treated group, even a year later, the last treatment was at three months, still had lower levels of those inflammatory cytokines. So it lower levels of the COMP and MMPs compared to the intra-articular injections and the short-term NSAID use. So some evidence coming out in humans as well. This was a study done, short-term study, um, at the University of Tennessee, Dr. Millis and Dr. Drum on dogs with end-stage elbow disease. So they were divided into two groups with a sham group and a treatment group. Um, the treatment got, group got two shockwave treatments, and then they were measuring ground reaction forces. And so they found that the shockwave treated group was using the leg more, they had increased weight bearing, increase in peak vertical force. And so the shockwave was helping them weight bear sooner, even with the end stage elbow. And then actually they did a crossover at the end. So the dogs that didn't get it in the beginning got it after the study was over, and they found the same results in those dogs as well. This case study is from St. Louis, one of my old hospitals up there where I was. This is Brutus, the 15-year-old Persian. Apparently everything's 15 in my talk today. But he had this progressive left hind limb weakness. And so on radiographs was diagnosed with the severe osteoarthritis in his left hip. And so they did two treatments two weeks apart. This was back in August of last year. And he was having a hard time getting in and out of the litter box. He couldn't jump up onto the bed or even onto the chair next to it. And so after the shockwave treatments, all of those symptoms got much better. So this is a terrible video, so I apologize, but this is Brutus getting shockwaved. He is wide awake, um, doing his hip kind of lower back area. And I need to follow up with them. I talked to them in July and they had not repeated the treatment yet and he was still doing well. Um, so I'll have to see where he's doing right now. But it was a very long lasting improvement for him on his jumping and improve that weakness. So similar to all the other joints with osteoarthritis, back pain, right? So this is an example of really severe spondylosis. Some of those chronic disc dogs, angle changes are going to be a good indication for the shockwave. And we say non-neurologic back pain, not necessarily because neurologic status matters, but because it's not regenerating nerves. So if it already has some CP deficits or a degenerative myelopathy, something like that, it's going to help with pain and inflammation if it's there, but it's not going to, you know, restore the neurologic status through the shockwave. This was a study done out in California on chronic back pain. So it was a retrospective study, 34 patients, 40 patients, 38 dogs, two cats. 34 of them got one treatment and six of them got two treatments um, of a thousand pulses. And again, treatment was well tolerated. There were no adverse effects. And so there was an 87.5% positive response. 77% of the patients showed improvement with one, one week. 
and median duration of improvement was 13 months. So they followed some of these patients out two years. And so they were having this sustained improvement after the shockwave treatment. More recent study, Dr. Katie Barnes at LSU did a short-term limb use study after TPLO. And so again, divided into two groups, a prospective randomized. So one group got two shockwave treatments, one group got nothing. And then she was measuring ground reaction forces. So peak vertical force, vertical impulse. And she found that those were both higher at two and eight weeks after surgery in the shockwave treated dogs when compared to the non-shockwave treated dogs. And this is a graph from that study. So blue is going to be your shockwave treatment and red is going to be your control. And so you can see that again, higher at two and eight weeks. And this sounds like a nice to have, right? That they're weight bearing sooner or their bones are healing sooner. But the nice part is we're all going to be worried about the other leg. We're worried about restrictions for the owner. We're worried about that plate maybe needing to come out and the bone being completely healed. So it has some significant clinical effects and effects for your patients and clients, not just kind of a nice to have fun that they walk sooner. Our rehab is going to be better. We're not going to lose as much muscle mass. And again, we're going to not be as worried because we're not offloading as much on the other knee that we know eventually might go as well. Last but not least, tendons, ligaments, muscles, bone healing, um, chronic pain in OA, and superficial wounds and lip granulomas. So any sort of infected wound, older wound, hit by car, degloving injury, and then lip granulomas. So works amazing for lip granulomas. This was a case sent to me by Dr. Pam Nichols out in Utah. The lip granuloma had been there 13 months. So that's on the left, middle is after one treatment, on the right is after two treatments, and that was a year ago, and it hasn't come back yet. So really good at reinitiating that healing process in those lick granulomas and wounds. So those are kind of the indications in review, right? Any of those things that we can non-invasively do are going to be good indications to think about the shockwave. Where are we headed, right? We've talked about some of the research that already exists. Um, in canine patients, there's a large study that's finishing up at Ohio State by Dr. Nina Kivas. It is sponsored by the Morris Animal Foundation. And so they're doing dogs with spondylosis or vertebral angle changes, those chronic back pain dogs. It is supposed to be completed by the end of the year and they're having really good success with that. So that's exciting. Colorado State is getting ready to enroll um, a large study on post-TPLO and partial cruciate patients following out osteoarthritis and other changes with x-rays and CTs and all sorts of cool things. Um, it's approved. I think they might be enrolling now, but that, and then they're going to get followed out a year. On the equine side, there's currently a study for bleeders, exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage. So they're having good success with those, which is really interesting because they used to always not want to shockwave into the lungs, but they found that it doesn't do any damage. It's actually helpful. And the sarcoid study. So sarcoids are those, you know, masses that just never seem to go away. And they're having really good success with using shockwave on sarcoids. On the human side, electrohydraulic shockwave specifically is FDA approved for plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, and diabetic ulcers. And they actually also use it for intravascular lithotripsy. So they will snake a shockwave up into an artery and actually break up a plaque so that they can put a stent in it, which is really cool. And one of the studies going on now is on cardiac infarcts or heart attacks. So this image on the right here is a graph from a rat study that they did where the top is normal heart. The bottom C is they went in and ligated in arterial muscle, I mean an arterial in the heart muscle, and did nothing and then harvested. The blue is all sort of the scar tissue and things that healed after we lost blood flow to that area. 
And then the middle B is the same thing. So they had those surgically ligated arteries in their heart, and then they got shockwave treatments. So they were finding that with shockwave, they were getting more normal muscle tissue and better heart pumping effects than if they didn't shockwave, which was super interesting. So I think they're moving on to pigs um, next before they would try it in humans, but just some exciting things I think on the horizon as they're trying to do more stuff with the shockwave. So how do we use it in our small animals? Okay, so for preparation, if we need make good contact, we do need to clip the hair, right? Long hair or double-coated dogs can often trap air in them, and so it's difficult. Whenever there's air, we're not going to get sound through there. So sometimes we need to clip the hair and wipe it down with alcohol or water, clean it off. We need to use ultrasound cell to make sure that we're having sound wave transmission. And Electrohydraulic shockwave specifically used to be uncomfortable. So it used to require sedation because that peak energy was high and it was not comfortable for the patients. But now there is a new trode with an expanded focal area. So they've taken that focal zone and opened it up a little bit so that they could lower that peak energy. So it's much, much more comfortable and does not require sedation anymore for most pets. Another cat. This is me shock waving over the shoulder. Again, cat's wide awake, um, no sedation, doing wonderful. So you're gonna slowly move the trode around. You're gonna think 360 degrees and 3D. It's not super specific exactly how you're angling. We're not worried about getting into joints, but we wanna make sure that we get as many cells as we can to absorb that energy and release cytokines and growth factors. So depending on your device is how quickly you can get the treatment done. Electrohydraulic devices take only about two to four minutes per treatment. Piezoelectric and electromagnetic are a little bit longer at about 10 to 15 minutes per area but there's no risk of damage. So it doesn't get hot, you can't cause any tissue damage, even if you held it in one place for the whole treatment. There's no special equipment required. So we don't need to have glasses, we don't need ear protection, we can be in the middle of a treatment area and we aren't affecting anybody else around us. So we don't, unlike you know the laser, some of those other modalities, we don't really have to be too worried about it scattering. After treatment, a few things can happen. So we talked about the analgesic effect. So occasionally they'll feel really good for the first two or three days. And that's just important to know because we still need to be exercise restricted, right? We can't take a dog that has an injury or chronic pain and all of a sudden it's numb and mom takes it on its first 10 mile hike in three years or it is going <laughs> to injure something else. Or occasionally they're going to have increased discomfort. So they're going to be a little bit more sore for the first couple days. You know, we're returning a chronic injury to an acute state. We're bringing in a lot of blood flow and sort of waking the body up to that area. So we just have to be prepared that sometimes it's a little more uncomfortable. I tell my clients that it could be, you know, kind of like a deep tissue massage or chiropractic, right? Sometimes it's sore before it feels better. Similar effects can occur after shockwave treatment. We evaluate every two weeks with electrohydraulic shockwave and retreat as necessary. And again, it's about one to three treatments, depending on the indication and what we're trying to heal or what our goals are. Case selection, there's no age minimum or maximum. So this is safe to use in puppies and kittens. It works great for long bone fractures. We did a delayed jaw fracture on a puppy a couple months ago, and then no age maximum. So our geriatrics that are going to have multi-jointed arthritis, 15, 16 years old, no contraindications in them either. We don't recommend using it acutely on soft tissue injuries or wounds. The body's usually kind of at max healing already, and it's often a little bit more uncomfortable to do the shockwave at that time. The exception to that rule is if we create the trauma, right? So if it had a TPLO or a fracture repair, we can treat immediately post-op then. You know, it's such a small trauma. It's not this big wound, damage, you know, rolled our ankle. So we do use it then. 
We don't treat directly over an unstable disc or spinal surgical site. So if it's had a hemilaminectomy or it has an unstable disc that we know of, we just don't go right over it. We can go around it, but we're not sure what putting that level of energy into an unstable disc would do. And it's hard to do that study. And we don't go over tumors. So osteosarcomas, mast cell tumors, things like that. We don't want to increase blood flow similar to some of our other modalities, right? Like laser. Um, palliative care would be a different story. But if it's something we're trying to treat, we don't want to increase blood flow to that area. So we'll leave on just a kind of an interesting little case example here. So again, Dr. Pam out in Utah. This was an 18-month German Shepherd and so came in for this progressive multi-limb lameness. So she took x-rays, put him on pain meds, and diagnosed with panosteitis. And so he was sent home. And a few days after he was home, the owner sent Dr. Pam a video. He's just really still painful. Is there anything else we can do? And so she said, okay, let's try and talk with it. So she ended up doing two treatments, but you can see this poor doggo on that right front leg um, being very lame. And again, it had already been on pain meds, so nothing else changed. But 48 hours after shock waving that shoulder, this is how he was walking. So owner was very, very happy. Okay, so just to review, I've said it a hundred times, but shock wave, high energy sound wave, nothing to do with electric shock, right? That sound energy gets released into the tissues and causes a physical stimulus to the cells. So then it releases cytokines and growth factors for healing. Different shockwave generators have different focal areas, and so therefore they're going to require different treatment protocols. And shockwave specifically, especially electrohydraulic shockwave, has been proven safe and effective. It has about 15 years of published research on these musculoskeletal indications. So safe, effective, we know that it works in the things that we're talking about treating. And, you know, pet owners specifically are really looking for these non-invasive advanced treatments. They don't always just want a non-steroidal or a drug medication option. And so the ability for a clinic to offer something that's proven safe, proven effective, sedation-free, this non-invasive regenerative healing option is going to set them apart, right? People are especially newer, younger um, owners are really looking for something like this for their patients. They really want something that is regenerative and non-invasive as an option. 